Thank you very much for the introduction. I welcome all the doctors who are here uh, to listen to this talk. Now, the talk given is di managing diabetes in uh, special situations. Now, there are a host of special situations which we will not be able to cover in the limited time given. So, we will basically uh, go about a uh, few of the special situations. Now, uh, defining special situations, hospitalized patients, pregnant patients, patients with renal insufficiency, elderly patients, Ramadan uh, observing patients, COVID-19, steroids. Now, what is the risk associated with special population, high risk of hyperglycemia, increased risk of infection, longer hospital stays, higher mortality rate. Now, first coming to the hospitalized patients, hyperglycemia, any patient, if uh, he has uh, uh, sugar one, more than 140, should be subjected to point of care testing in the hospital. Uh, hyperglycemia is uh, defined as mild that is 54 to 70 less than 54 is uh, something which is very very uh, critical hypoglycemia and if the patient requires assistance then that is a very very dire emergency to be attended immediately all of these hypoglycemias are emergency in hospitalized patients and we should see to it that patients don't get into hypoglycemia now ada recommends that uh, uh, insulin therapy be initiated if uh, the sugars remain more than 180 and so select patients we can go for uh, stringent targets of 110 to 140 otherwise we should settle for a target for of 140 to 180 because hypoglycemia is uh, detrimental now the conventional therapy being used by the uh, uh, in the older times was uh, sliding scale insulin therapy which is a condemned therapy and we should not be used because it leads to high glycemic variability and roller coaster control of diabetes and what we should be giving nowadays is basal bolus therapy which uh, entails uh, administration of a long acting basal insulin uh, along with the prandial and correctional short acting insulin. Why shift in preference from SSI to BBI is based on these three trials, RABBIT2 which demonstrated improved glycemic control, improved outcomes, RABBIT2 surgery trial in surgical patients which again demonstrated better results in patients on basal bolus therapy and basal bolus trial. Now, pre-mixed uh, uh, insulins are to be discouraged in hospitalized patients because they also lead to high glycemic variability uh, and uh, the uh, chances of hypoglycemia are more. However, the patient is very stable already on pre-mixed uh, regimen, well controlled and the medical condition is also stable, you can continue with it. Hypoglycemia is a major concern for hospitalized patients, because, uh, especially uh, if the patient has diseases like heart failure, renal failure, advanced age advanced liver disease uh, if patient is on intense insulin uh, treatment and infections in all these conditions patients uh, has more liability to go into hypoglycemia and should be accordingly managed and the touch, uh, hypoglycemia generally is a result of several things it may be dosing errors it may be nutritional insulin mismatch it may be some medications basically it may be deteriorating renal condition deteriorating the general condition with poor intake so a host of factors will decide this and you have to look for these factors and modify your regimen accordingly the type of treatment in hospitalized patient may be continuous IV infusion in ICU critical patients and you may go for BBI in patients who are stable basically as the patient is already on OHAs and a very very stable condition you can continue with that Hospitalized patients on enteral if the patient is on to total parental nutrition, you may require uh, uh, basal with the prandial insulin, so you can go about with the insulin infusion. If patient is on RT feeding, there you can go for a basal insulin with uh, a sliding scale uh, correctional insulin of sugar. So depending on the uh, condition the patient has, uh, we have to go about the insulin therapy. The ADA recommendations basically in patients who are perioperative is to have a sugar of 80 to 180 and non-cardiac general surgery patients if you can have even better sugars it will be better general measures for glycemic measurement during in hospital stays uh, so basically you have to be very particular if your patient is on insulin infusion uh, once you go for transition to sub-Q you have to give the insulin well in advance after calculating the dose and uh, take care that the sugars do not shoot up during this transition when the patient comes from home to a hospital, you have to assess his uh, uh, previous sugar control and you have to assess his condition which, uh, with, which he has presented and accordingly you should try to drop the secret of oxalic sulfonylase like natagalanase 
and you should uh, of, uh, keep only those uh, oral agents which have less chances of hypoglycemia like uh, GP4 inhibitors and initiate insulin in these patients. Uh, on the discharge, basically, you have to see the pre-admission uh, status of the patient. If pre-admission sugars were controlled, you discharge the patient on the same regimen. And if the pre-admission sugars were not controlled, uh, then you have to modify the regimen accordingly. And the regimen has to be sim uh, simple, otherwise the patient uh, would not uh, be in a position to follow it and uh, take precautions. Now, coming to the pregnancy, pregnancy, hyperglycemia, uh, is common in pregnancy and insulin therapy is a gold standard here although you can use other drugs like metformin and glibin uh, recommended glycemic targets generally the sugar should be fasting should be less than 95 one hour should be less than 140 and two hours should be one less than one th uh, 120 uh, although it is better to keep all sugars below 130 uh, mm -hmm. so that there is no maternal transfer of glucose from the um, uh, maternal circulation to the fetus and chances of future uh, development of diabetes in fetus is uh, negative. So you have to go for a tighter controls. The dose generally which we start with is uh, 0 0.7 to 1 uh, units per kg and that is uh, divided two third in the morning, two third in the evening. Uh, two, uh, it is uh, uh, basal and uh, bolus uh, 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 insulins which are used basically. Uh, intrapartum generally the insulin requirements go down so you have to be very careful in the intrapartum and decrease the insulin accordingly. Uh, insulin resistance is dramatically lowered in uh, immediately postpartum and there is increased risk of natural hypoglycemia so the therapy has to be accordingly modified. Long acting basal insulins like glargin, Detamir are uh, favored for use in these conditions. Coming to the individuals with renal efficiency, renal impairment is very common in diabetes. Almost 40% of the type 2 diabetics uh, go on to develop uh, renal disease. Hypoglycemia risk is in, sir, uh, increased. CV risk is also increased. And the metabolism and excretion of drugs also through the kidneys is also altered. So renal failure is associated with reduced renal insulin clearance and higher susceptibility to hypoglycemia. The glycemic targets in non-pregnant adults is generally less than 7. However, if the patient has comorbid conditions and is getting hypoglycemia episodes, you can go to a higher HbA1c level of 8, 8.5 as per the patient requirement. Now, this is a chart of drugs, basically, uh, the GFR at which these drugs can be used. Uh, but you have to uh, uh, just I will point out psyllium features, uh, uh, the secret goals like sulfonylureas, are uh, uh, to be avoided or to be reduced. Uh, glucoside is a drug which, uh, uh, sorry, glucoside is a drug which is favored because it has predominantly hepatic clearance rather than real clearance. However, you can use glucoside and uh, glucoside in lower dosages. Uh, alpha glucosidase inhibitors should not be used beyond a creatinine of 2.5. Uh, uh, you can use thioglitazone at all stages, but it causes weight gain and fluid retention, so not uh, favored. GLP-1 receptors you can use in these patients basically, but once the uh, EGFR is very much down, uh, uh, nausea and poor intake may jeopardize its use and therefore it, there it can be avoided. Uh, the DPP-4, some are, uh, do not require dose modifications, some require dose modification and accordingly they should be used. So insulin therapy generally you can use basal bolus therapy in uh, security patients but as the EG, EGFR goes very low and patient nears the end stage disease the basal insulin may not be required and you can manage the patient only with the bolus insulin. Coming to elderly patients they have different uh, problems and the vast majority of diabetics are elderly they have attenuated beta cell function and insulin resistance is there more prone, more prone for hypoglycemia. Hypoglycemia during the first year is uh, signals a worse prognosis and there is a growing proportion of older individuals. They may have cognitive impairment, they have, may have visual impairment, they may have auditory impairment and therefore the management has to be individualized uh, very carefully to each patient. Uh, they have a lot of complications arising from diabetes, coexisting comorbidities and risk of hypoglycemia. So, uh, there is no definition of elderly population. A person at 80 also may be very fit and a patient at 60 may be. So, elderly I will define by his uh, physical illnesses, by his uh, physical build, by his uh, 
uh, abilities to perform daily activities and accordingly we can go about deciding the HBNC and the patient is having a lo lot of comorbidities and uh, is frail and has other issues like psychological disturbances like uh, so we can settle for a higher HBNC of 8 in, uh, or 8.5 in these patients. Uh, coming to the Ramadan fasting, uh, this is uh, a very, very common thing because almost uh, during Ramadan, uh, 116 million uh, uh, people with diabetes fast basically for cultural and social reasons. However, uh, if the patient is having high risk, uh, very high risk, high risk status, we should uh, ask them to avoid fasting as it is permitted in the religion that those who cannot fast should not fast and for low risk or moderate patients we can individualize treatment uh, as per uh, after talking to the patients. Uh, the Ramadan causes a lot of ketone generation and there is a glycolysis so there is a hyperglycemia and ketosis in these patients and accordingly the patients should be looked at. There is a high propensity of hypoglycemia, hyperglycemia, diabetic ketoacidosis, dehydration and thrombosis in these patients. So you have to see the patient before Ramadan, uh, individualized management plan and you also have to go for post-Ramadan follow. And uh, here again the uh, sugar should not go below 70 and more than 300 basically. If they do so, you should advise the patient to break the fast and be more particular about the food and the uh, treatment. And here again the basal oral therapy is the treatment of choice and the oral agents also have, be, have to be accordingly modified. Coming to COVID-19, COVID-19 basically has stress hyperglycemia, a patient may be diabetic or may have developed new diabetes, uh, also may have comorbid conditions like hypertension, CVD, and on top of the ARDS, all this leads to adverse outcomes. So managing inpatient hyperglycemia can be challenging and complex in COVID-19 patients. Potential mechanisms for development of new onset diabetes in COVID-19, stress hyperglycemia, beta cell dysfunction in hospital steroid use, pre-existing diabetes, and there is also a theory of direct affection of beta cells by uh, COVID-19 viruses. So the, there is a bi-directional link of hyperglycemia COVID-19. Uh, it worsens the prognosis and there are a lot of uh, uh, coexisting comorbidities which along with hyperglycemia uh, with COVID-19 leads to poor results in our patients. So 1 in 10 COVID-19 patients with diabetes die within 7 days of hospital admission. 1 in 7 COVID-19 patients with diabetes are admitted in ICU. 75% of Indian diabetic patients have higher COVID-19 mortality risk. So steroid-induced hyperglycemia is use of steroid treatment in patients with pre-existing diabetes, resulting in worsening glucose control. Steroid-induced diabetes is rising glucose occurring in patients without a known diagnosis. Diabetes may or may not resolve when the steroids are withdrawn. 32% uh, of the non-diabetics who receive steroids develop steroid-induced hyperglycemia. 18% of the non-diabetics uh, will develop diabetes. And these are the class of patients who are predisposed to develop diabetes uh, the mechanisms are several, that is the impaired inflating effect, there is a decreased insulin effect and more of glucagon, more glucose production, more lipolysis, uh, decreased uptake of glucose uh, at the level of skeletal muscles which are the highest uh, uh, sort of uh, uh, uptake of glucose occurs in skeletal muscles, more of proteolysis and decreased capillary recruitment uh, at the level of skeletal muscles. So the diagnosis is same as the ADA criteria. Now what happens is that steroid is a very commonly prescribed drug in uh, patients who are on oxygen on ventilation and you can see there are more chances of bacterial infection, viral infections in patients of steroids, more atypical infections in patients of steroids. So despite their benefits, glucocorticoid endorsed hyperglycemia remains a common metabolic concern in patients with or without diabetes. Uncontrolled diabetes leads to severe COVID-19 resulting in higher ICU admissions, increased morbidity and mortality. Optimum glycemic control and judicious use, right drug dose duration of steroids during 19 will improve COVID-19 outcomes. Coming to management, so mild cases can be managed with oral hypoglycemic agents and there the DPP-4 are the favored agents. Uh, the indications are if the sugars are less than 200 in patients without known diabetes or with diabetes, adequately controlled by lifestyle modification and oral hypoglycemic agents, they can be given OHAs. Steroids, we'll just see the classification, short-acting hydrocortisone uh, with a half-life of two hours, 
interjecting prednisolone and methyl prednisolone most commonly used with a half life of 2.5 hours and long acting dexamethasone with a half life of 4 hours however uh, 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 prednisolone uh, will have almost 12 to 14 hours of hyperglycemia and dexamethasone almost round the clock hyperglycemia so if you see the short acting this is uh, uh, the uh, hydrocortisone which is uh, so the sugars go up and come down these can be managed with prandial insulin routine prandial insulin uh, if you give hydrocortisone twice daily you have two peaks so you can give two prandial insulin before the injection of hydrocortisone this is prednisolone or methylprednisolone if you give at 8 am you will have hyperglycemia till the evening and next day fasting will be normal they are here the best that to use is the uh, nph insulin basically and NPH insulin has a profile very similar to the hyperglycemia rise in the patients with uh, uh, prednisolone. However, if it is used twice a day or thrice a day, then you can see that there is a persistent hyperglycemia. And here you will have to add a basal insulin along with the prandial insulin and correctional insulin. Long acting glucocor cell like dexamethasone leads to round the clock hyperglycemia and here again you will have to manage these patients with long acting basal insulins like uh, glargine, Tugio or uh, Tresiva and uh, you have to supplement the prandial insulin and correctional insulin in these patients. Why insulin steroid induced hyperglycemia? Benefits that insulin offer are immediate onset of action, easy titration, unlimited efficacy, greater flexibility and predictability, rapid ability to target post ventral hyperglycemia, those can be modified related to patient oral intake. Why not oral agents? Because oral agents have limited efficacy, slow action, onset of action, uh, metformin, pyoglazone, may uh, take up to two weeks mm -hmm. to have their optimal effect, which is not permissible in these patients. We have to control sugars urgently. Very limited or non-existent ability to titrate. Uh, action profile of OHS does not coincide with the pattern of steroid-induced hyperglycemia. Now, there are JBDS 2018 guidelines which uh, uh, clearly say that you have to use basal insulins uh, if hyperglycemia is present throughout the day and we have seen the patterns of glucose rise and the insulins that can be used. Again, the ADA 2000 prednisolone, OD uh, and pH you can give in the, before giving and dexamethasone long acting insulins. So this is the chart basically I will not go into detail because this is exactly the same which we have discussed. So I'll skip this chart. Adjusting insulin while tapping stress is also very important because if you don't st properly taper insulin after uh, the uh, 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 steroid dose you have burned down, you will end up with hypoglycemia which occurs post discharge very commonly. So when steroids are tapered by 50%, insulin dose is suggested to be reduced by 25%. So coming to the final slide, maintenance of optimal glycemic control in special situations remains an enormous clinical challenge. Insulin therapy is recommended for type 2 diabetic management in special populations and situations such as elderly people, pregnant women, obese individuals, people observing Ramadan fast, hospital expression and the presence of comorbidities as these special situations are susceptible to complications such as high risk of hypoglycemia. These people need constant glucose monitoring and insulin dose adjustments wherever applicable. Thank you very much.